I'll continue in English, it's better for all of us. Um, here we are. Uh, always a great pleasure to come to this conference in Paris, one of my favorite conferences, I can say. Um, and only a quick train ride away from Amsterdam. Um, here's my little overview. I'll explain a little bit about cognitive biases, but also cognitive problems in people with alcohol use disorders. Then the training, what can we do? And I'll make a little comparison with medication and talk a little bit in uh, extra time probably about next steps. Um, so what are cognitive biases? They are basically a cluster of biased patterns of information processing. We in a review distinguished between three groups. So there's attention um, and then within that you can have strong engagement or impaired disengagement. There's all sorts of memory associations people have as soon as they see, smell, feel the drink. And there's action tendencies, and then we talk about automatically triggered approach tendencies. Uh, many studies have now found that they have a unique prediction in the uh, prediction of the behavior, also after you control for explicit cognitions. And there's also a dozen or so studies showing that especially in those people with relatively weak executive control, these relatively automatic processes are important. So here we are. What do you see? Um, this actually works better late afternoon. What is your first association and what is your tendency of movement? Of course, it's not the whole story. Um, as already mentioned in the introduction, there's also all sorts of executive control problems. The interpretation is always a bit tricky because we also know, and it's actually relating to Patricia Conrad's work and others, that it's also a precursor. It's also a risk factor if you forget all your appointments. Um, but it could also be a consequence. There's also more general processes and in a collaboration, I'm actually just back from Australia uh, where I collaborate with several labs and there's a very nice work there on within session conditioned reward cues which capture attention more in people who are more prone to addiction. So it might be a more general mechanism where you specifically learn the gambling stimuli, alcohol stimuli, smoking stimuli, etc. Uh, of course, there's still other things like suboptimal self-insight, etc. So we used to interpret these differences from a dual process perspective. Um, so then the idea is as people develop an addiction, they get stronger and stronger automatic reactions and we control. However, dual process models have been criticized in general. So there's a nice paper by Karen and Schul, for example, and we move to more continuous alternatives. Example is a paper by uh, Thomas Gladwin, my former postdoc in developmental cognitive neuroscience. Uh, people now also more focus on different goals people have. So um, then you don't need the, the qualitatively different processes. And in a TICS paper we recently proposed a uni model with meta control as a moderator if you're interested in the theory side of things. So what do we know in a little summary? There are cognitive biases. I always like to emphasize that they are relative. So this means that sometimes people interpret these biases like there's no way to stop myself uh, if I'm addicted from taking the drug. That's not the reality. So what you find is an average, say, approach bias over people and over trials. But even within one person, it fluctuates. So you get it on average, but definitely not in each trial. And also, if you compare different people with an alcohol problem, it's about half who have, for example, an approach bias, about a quarter who don't have a bias, and about a quarter who have already an avoidance bias. And then, of course, the important question is, to what extent can we remediate these problems? Um, we know that these cognitive biases are really learned, so you can actually see to what extent you can retrain them. With the executive control, it's a bit tricky. As I mentioned, it could also be a precursor. 
So if, say, for example, your patient scores low on working memory and you train and it gets, the patient gets to, say, in between the original level but lower than average, you don't really know whether this is partial remediation or full remediation of something which was suboptimal to begin with. All right, so that's a little stage setting. Now, where are we with cognitive training? Um, recently, I published this figure, which I think is handy to just classify. I always used to draw it for uh, students. Um, and then I was asked to do this commentary, and I thought, oh, this might actually be a good thing to uh, uh, publish my little sketch. So basically, I think it is important in cognitive training to distinguish between two broad classes. So the one class, is there a pointer here? I'm not sure. Anyway, the one on the left, you see a class which is about general ability training. So and we know many people with addictions have suboptimal self-insight, self-control, inhibition, working memory. So you can train these different uh, psychological functions and there's no specific stimuli involved, whether it's alcohol or gambling. Thanks. So that's, say, the left side. And then we have the family of interventions called cognitive bias modification, where you will always have specific cues relating to the disorder. So if it's alcohol, you're going to know what you're doing because you put in alcohol cues. And then, of course, it depends which of the biases you target, attention, memory, action tendency, how exactly you do it. All right, so a little update, training general abilities. Uh, positive claims have been made, for example, Torko Klimberg from Sweden, uh, overview paper in ticks, claiming all sorts of successes. However, uh, there are huge problems with generalization. So typically, and this is in the ADHD children literature, who also suffer from suboptimal executive functions and are at risk for addictions, of course. Um, so Generally, the, the pattern of results is you can train a specific task, but once you do different tasks, and especially if they get more different, there's really not much evidence for generalization, let alone to the relevant behaviors. So as you see in this type of task, there's no alcohol cues. So you just train, in this case, a working memory task. We actually have more complex versions now, but it doesn't matter. And then the question is, can you improve this type of working memory? And the answer is yes, as you see. Uh, and in the control condition, they remain at the same level of three. So everyone has always success here, whereas here you're actually tailored to an optimal level. So that means that if just experiencing success would be the mechanism, the control group would actually get more success. Okay, so what do we find? Yes, we can improve this function, working memory, more in the active condition. It also stays on a little bit. Of course, not forever. It's a bit like doing the gym. Uh, but it's not that bad. It doesn't immediately disappear. But the question is, does it help problem drinkers who want to reduce, reduce their drinking? Some evidence, not a strong effect. It gets significant once you factor in their automatic evaluations of alcohol. So that means that only those people with strong, positive, automatic preferences for alcohol actually benefit from this type of control training, which, of mm. course, makes some sense. Uh, Warren Bickle does a lot of this type of training. He found effects in... Um, stimulant addiction on delay discounting. And in this recent paper with alcohol use, so this is the paper my uh, commentary uh, was a comment on, um, he f also found generalization of working memory training mm -hmm. to future episodic thinking. And that actually is a nice thing because it's about how do I plan concrete things for the future which might have therapeutic benefits. So. Um, I think this first branch of training holds promise in a clinical setting. Uh, as Marcia Bates has argued, and I think it's a very good point, 
it can actually also be a motivating factor to let your patients know they're on the recovery track. However, you need tons of sessions and generalization is always a difficult issue. So then we go to the other branch, uh, this side. Uh, cognitive bias modification. So as I mentioned, different cognitive biases have been related to psychopathology in general, addictions, all different addictions and health problems, both cross-sectionally and prospectively. Now it is crucial to understand where cognitive bias modification comes from, because the original question it addressed was the question of causality. It was not originally developed as an intervention, as a clinical intervention. But if you have tons of studies showing correlations, you still don't know whether there's actually causality. Of course, the royal road to establishing causality is to do an experiment. So then the question is, if we change the bias, does it actually affect behavior? And how you do you do this? Well, you take the students who happen to be around and you can change them actually in both directions. So the first CBM study, 2002, Colin McLeod, he took like middle level anxiety students, trained one group toward threat, which of course you would never do in a clinical sample, and the other away from threat, and then showed that in a subsequent stress-inducing situation, the first group got way more stressed than the second group. So then you know this is a causal factor, but it doesn't mean by itself it's an intervention. Okay, so how does it work? Let's get it concrete. Uh, so this is um, one example of an attentional bias test, the visual probe or dot probe test, where you will see uh, alcohol pictures or non-alcohol pictures, and actually at the same time, as you see, and then you indicate as a participant whether you see one or two pixels, and these can be in the place of alcohol or in the other place. It's probably the worst test you can have in terms of reliability. It's very close to zero. It's really bad. Uh, so one of the programs, and this is another Australian friend and colleague, one of the major things they're working on now is developing more reliable instruments. However, the nice thing is you can easily change the measurement instrument without telling anyone and make it into a training instrument by, for example, if you take middle drinking students either have all the dots behind the alcohol, train them toward alcohol or away from alcohol, which would be the clinical, clini clinically relevant uh, variety. So in this first proof of principle study, um, we took binge drinking students. So then after consulting our ethical committee, they thought it was not necessary to train them further to alcohol, uh, but we wanted to see, is there an effect on drinking and, of course, generalization. And here's the effect, and it's kind of typical for all of these uh, early attentional training studies. What you see is you get an effect of a single session, but it doesn't generalize or not significantly to untrained pictures and also no effects on drinking in this study. So basically, this is the general conclusion a bit like the working memory, but this is only a single session. So then the question was, what if we do multiple sessions? So here we have people who have an alcohol use disorder, and now they're randomized to either a group in who gets five sessions of retraining with novel pictures in every session to foster generalization, or control uh, training, which is another test, but it uses the exact same pictures but we're not training anything. But the nice thing is you can give the same motivating feedback. And what you see here, so this axis is the attentional bias, is that actually in the control group, attentional bias goes up. And of course, this is a very small study, so we weren't too sure about it. But in the last study of this series, we have a very big study, 1,400 patients. We see the exact same thing. So it seems that on average, your patients when they are abstinent, their attentional bias grows. And actually, last night with the next speaker, I discussed something. It might be related to increases in the gut. Ghrelin, for example. We want to test that. Um, 
the good news is we can actually do something about it. So the retrained group now, and this is for untrained pictures, gets a negative attentional bias. And the nice thing is, it makes them relapse later. Of course, small study, uh, but confirmed in this recent big study. So then we move to the next bias, so that's the approach bias. I'll show you first again how we assess it and then how we change it. So the idea here is you work with a joystick and people react to the format of the picture. So if they see this portrait picture, they pull the joystick and as you see, it approaches and this is avoidance then. And what you get in assessment, if you have heavy drinkers, they're faster to pull alcohol pictures. And we now recently showed the same thing with um, gambling also, as mentioned in the introduction, we've shown it with cannabis. So it's also a general bias with different addictions. People tend to automatically um, approach stimuli which are relevant for them. And it's not a general thing in the sense that we also had general positive, general negative pictures in the same study and we didn't find any differences. And it's also related to the OPRAM1 gene, which is also related to Q-induced craving. So it could be related to a strong vulnerability to learn strong appetitive reactions. Same gene has also been related to obesity. So same idea, we have a bias, can we change it in students? Answer was yes. Actually with generalization in a single session, so that was a very promising result. So then we moved it to the clinic. So here's the first of a series of large studies we did in a collaborating German clinic of Johannes Lindenmeyer. It's uh, in uh, not too far from Berlin. And here what we had was action tendency training. So two groups trained were trained to push alcohol pictures away for four sessions. And the one difference between the two groups was we told one group and we didn't tell the other group, didn't make any difference. Then we had a 50-50 assessment control and a no training group. Also the two training groups didn't make any difference. So we collapsed them. What you see here is that we have a very strong generalized effect. So remember we trained them with pictures and the joystick. This is a different test where you sort words, alcohol with approach in one phase, alcohol with avoid in the other phase. The blue bars, a positive value, it means that uh, on average, people are faster to sort alcohol with approach words, even though they are patients with lots of alcohol problems on average for 12 years. If you don't train, it's not gonna change. However, we can change it, but you need this targeted training. And it flips to the other side, which means that now they're faster to sort alcohol with avoid words even though they trained on pictures. So strong generalization. And then the nice thing, this clinic routinely has a one year follow up. So we just get the data one year later and guess what? 13% less relapse if you add, and this was only four sessions of targeted training to the regular treatment. It's different from standalone, it's important. So of course, important question, does it replicate? The answer is yes, 9% less difference and it's a complicated figure, but it means we got mediation and moderation. So the mediation part is here. So the one year treatment outcome effect is mediated by the change in approach bias and you get most of the change if you have a strong approach bias to begin with. Very similar to what Warren Bickle shows for working memory, but then of course, those patients with weak working memory profit most from working memory training. It also works if you do it upside down in Australia. Um, this is a group, um, the turning point, Dan Lapman and the principal investigator Antonio Verdejo Garcia, and they actually found a very big effect, over 20% difference, but it's a very small study. Interesting difference is they did it during detoxification. So it's an indication that we might actually be able to get bigger effects when you do it earlier on in the treatment process. But of course, a direct comparison study needs to be done. Um, 
This is uh, Corinne de Weers, who now, this is my cousin, and she now works with Nora Volkov. Uh, she did her PhD in Berlin, as you see here, and was interested in um, neural effects of addiction, but also of training. So we collaborated on this study where the training took place in the um, institution and she did the Curie activity and approach bias in the scanner in Berlin pre and post. And what she found, as you see here, um, if you do real training, the Curie activity in the amygdala goes down more strongly than when you do control training. And remember, the placebo or control training, they see the exact same pictures. So it can't be just Q reactivity. It's the targeted training which makes the difference. She also did the um, approach avoidance in the scanner and actually found the approach bias in the scanner. I was surprised there. Um, and also a stronger reduction in the medial prefrontal cortex activity relating to this approach bias for alcohol if you do the real training versus sham training. So we get some idea of neural mechanisms of the training. And now I'll share the latest data, which is in press now for two weeks or so, where, as I mentioned, we have 1,400 patients now with one year follow-up. Uh, it will come out in Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology this year or next year. And we combined the two types of CBM training that I just showed. So attentional training, approach bias training, or a bit of both. So everyone gets six sessions, six session one or three plus three, or every related placebo. And here are the follow-up data after one year. If you don't have training or placebo training, we get again the kind of average relapse of some 55% but it goes down by 8.5% if you do any of the training. There's no significant differences between the different varieties of training, but what you see is that the attentional training basically works as well as the other, at least. We expected the combination to do best, but meanwhile we had a paper showing that on average people need six sessions, so probably three plus three was a little bit too less. Um, so again, these um, beneficial effects and specific changes. So if you target approach bias, you get the change in approach bias. If you target attentional bias, you get the change in attentional bias. Um, there were measurement issues which uh, probably precluded the finding the me replicating the mediation effect. Um, yeah, this I already mentioned. So if you see this line of research, you think, well, this is real nice, useful tool to add to um, the addiction treatment, especially for alcohol where most of the evidence is. So we were quite surprised when we saw this meta-analysis by somebody who's done meta-analysis also on CBM and anxiety, who concluded that there was no effect. So how can this be? Well, that is what, this is what is the risk uh, when you combine apples and oranges, so what I already mentioned in the beginning, there's really qualitatively different types of studies. So on the one hand, if you try to establish a mechanism in students, you can also train them toward the alcohol because you want to show the causality and you have clinical trials. So this paper should come out any moment. It's in the May issue of Journal of Studies, Alcohol and Drugs, but it didn't come out yet. Um, but we argue, as I mentioned, that there's really these different, completely different lines of research which you shouldn't combine. So on the one hand, there's these student studies. They are not interested in changing their drinking, not at all. Why do they participate? To get free beer and money on top, as we sometimes advertise. Um, what do you find if you just look at those studies, and it's very similar to what you find in anxiety actually, that is that if you succeed in changing the bias, you typically get a small lived effect. So a little bit less of beer tasting in the experimental group than in the control group, but of course no clinical change. You've seen almost all of the clinical trials, consistent add-on effects of approximately 10%, maybe even more if you do it close to detox, but that needs 
verification. And then we have a kind of in-between, and that's the online trials. Uh, there's one published by ourselves, but there's one other in the pipeline from our group and one of Matt Field's group. What we typically find here is a main effect. So everyone gets better, everyone wins prizes. Doesn't matter if you're in the experimental condition or in the control condition. So probably there, just doing something, getting more self-efficacy is already helpful to reduce drinking in most people. So the good news is it doesn't harm. The bad news is it's not a specific effect like in the real clinical trials. So we also argued that this is actually a symptom of a broader problem and there was a lot to do about this last fall or this winter actually um, that NIH changed the clinical trials policies that basically every experimental study is a clinical trial just as those uh, meta-analysis folks did so we argued it's really not a good thing to combine these many other people signed petitions etc and the last news is that the Congress actually stopped this uh, folly, I would say. So in conclusion, CBM appears to work. Most of the evidence is in alcohol use disorder, but only when people want to change, but they have problems in actually implementing their change because strong curativity, cur we also have a study showing uh, strong bias, impulsivity, etc. It's not a cure for binge drinking students who are not motivated to change. If you can first change or increase the motivation to change, it might be helpful, but also the profile is a bit different. So how big are these effects? If we compare medication, current medications, a uh, number needed to treat meta-analysis in uh, JAMA a couple of years ago is 12, both for a camprosate for abstinence and for naltroxone, naltroxone, naltrexone, for reduced drinking. And interesting, if we take the conservative estimate based on the two largest studies, so difference eight and a half, nine percent, it's the exact same number. But it could even be bigger when you get close to the detox. But again, that needs verification. There are interesting differences also. As I show, cognitive training seems to really be an interesting add-on to treatment, both the general ability training and cognitive bias modification, not so effective so far as standalone. Medication seems to work the other way around. And as an example, we did a, a big baclofen study on top of regular treatment, no effects whatsoever. Um, Another study with high-dose baclofen of Müller and colleagues in Berlin, they did find an effect, but there was no other treatment. So actually one thing we're interested in now, could baclofen primarily work in those people who for some reason don't respond to psychosocial treatment? All right, last couple of minutes for ways we're working on improvements now. Of course, gamification is one thing. We were more enthusiastic originally because we thought, you know, all these binge drinking students, if we make it more playful, uh, they might do the training and reduce their drinking or cannabis smoking. The problem is making it more playful will increase the motivation to do the training. It's less boring, but it doesn't mean that it will increase their motivation to change their behavior. That's really a different thing. Um, I think interesting from a clinical perspective is this line where we started where you more personalize the alternative goals and this comes from smoking research where you know in alcohol you have alcohol versus non-alcoholic drinks which is relevant for everyone because one day you come to albatross after your drinking problem and you know there's people with champagne at the door already so you always need non-alcohol alternatives right so it's a very common thing but what is non-smoking philosophical question actually it is very personal so for some people they want to quit smoking to please their partner see their children longer many different reasons so actually we have a proof of principle study here and we're working on it more systematically now if you personalize the means but also alternative goals for people with 
quitting smoking, it might also work for other addictions. Um, as I mentioned, there's lots of variability in how much training people need, so obviously we should personalize that. And recently we started to consider doing training after reactivation of memories by Q-exposure. And that is actually related to um, a line of research in PTSD, memory reconsolidation interference. And if you're interested, uh, there is a paper in smoking uh, by Germerod et al. And we have a paper online first now in Psychopharm with alcohol. Interesting results. And then um, we have a line of research like your prize winner, Aradia, adding neurostimulation. We have most of the studies with TDCS so far, and here's the first study just showing the, that if you add TDCS to the training, what we found was we actually increase the learning a little bit, but it's not like they don't learn it, so it doesn't seem the interaction is so important. However, in now two studies, the second is in the pipeline, we find a main effect for TDCS as well on the one-year follow-up. So it does seem to add also, so you can do training, but maybe TDCS or RTMS, which is more focused, could actually give another additional input to improving treatment outcomes. So in conclusion, cognitive training can be of use in the treatment of addictions. General ability training, I think there's some promise, but it's long, and I would definitely recommend it for inpatient treatment, not so sure about outpatient, but maybe with good gamification, personalized feedback, etc. but there's a long road there. For CBM, it's clearly effective as an add-on to regular treatment for alcohol. Now, several studies showing approximately some 10% less relapse a year after treatment discharge, so that's quite good. Obviously, also, there's room for improvements, uh, as I just gave you some examples. So here's the Lindau team where we do the clinical work, and I like to acknowledge, oh yeah, and this is Marilisa Boffa and Matt Field, who I did the reanalysis of the meta-analysis with, and um, many other collaborators, and maybe time for a question or two. Thank you for your very nice presentation. Thank you. I, I have two, two questions. First question is, uh, did you distinguish in your studies uh, patients with uh, addictions with or without personality disorders, such as borderline personality disorders, or uh, antisocial personality disorders? Um, we have a paper in the pipeline looking at comorbidity. Um, and I think it was primarily axis one. But the good news is there that uh, it didn't interact at all with training outcomes. So whether people were also anxious or depressed or not did not affect training outcomes. So it's roughly the same 10% who profit from it. Um, I'm not sure if we have a personal personality data there. And if we have, it's gonna be a questionnaire, which is of course not the best way to assess it. So I'm not sure. Okay, so thank you. And uh, my second question is, um, in, in France, like uh, in many other countries, we lack of uh, psychologists or neuropsychologists to do um, uh, cognitive training. Uh, is it possible, I, I met recently uh, colleagues from Yale University who use um, internet uh, cognitive training. Is it uh, do you think it's possible to use? Uh, yeah, so yeah. Um, um, first, uh, I don't think you need like very highly qualified people to do the inpatient training. We typically do it with um, interns mm -hmm. and you know, basically they gotta be able to start a computer at the right point and uh, get the patient behind the computer. That's okay. Uh, so we also have this line of research for internet-based training. Um, and there so far, um, we get basically mostly the main effect of time. So the question is, does it not work as specifically or is it related to a different treatment outcome? Because of course in the clinic, everyone has the abstinence outcome, otherwise you're kicked out. 
Whereas at home, you choose your own goal. And guess what? Almost everyone chooses reduced drinking. And that's what they do. Um, so um, we did one study on smoking uh, with the internet. And I think it's illustrative of what can happen. So we uh, threw a national site to help people stop smoking. Uh, more than 2,000 people signed up. Um, but we wanted people who actually made a quit attempt. So then they had to leave their phone number. One of our research assistants found them. Uh, did you really make a quit attempt today as you uh, were planning? And you, they just got some information. And if they did, they were allowed into the stu study. So then we had some 700 left. The other 1,300 says, yeah, still want to quit, but maybe next time. Um, of those 700, half get training, half get placebo training, we get um, a doubling from 25 to 50% of the successful abstinence after half a year by the training. So that seems to suggest that also over internet, if people are motivated and actually have an abstinence goal, it might be helpful. And I think this could be further improved by personalizing alternatives, etc. So that's one of the things we're working on. So most of the data in the alcohol field so far has just found main effects. We do have the exception with smoking, which has an abstinence goal. So it's a bit confounded, but I think the goal and the motivation are really crucial to get training effects. Thank you. One question or two questions from the audience. Uh, hello, Florence Vorspan from Fernand Vidal Hospital in Paris. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk. I had a, a more philosophical question because our patients have been drinking for like 20 days, very high amounts of alcohol, and they are highly trained to, uh, yeah. to, to find alcohol, to taste alcohol, etc. And of course, the attentional bias, that's the result of their uh, years of training to drink. And do you include or do you think of including uh, training to find or, 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 or uh, focus their attention on other things? And, and, and how yeah, to... Yeah, so that's the alternative goals. So this is also the broader perspective where I think the cognitive training uh, does have an effect. If you have a long-term treatment goal, and so far the best way to do that is a combination of motivational interviewing, CBT. So this is a clinical context. But a subgroup of your patients may be aware that they have good reasons to change, etc. but because of strong Q reactivity, it's just very hard in the moment. Now, I think for that group is where the training really has an effect. Because this first tendency to take the glass of champagne, even though, you know, you rationally know you shouldn't, that's a strong one. And that's also what some patients describe in more qualitative uh, way and what I think the neuroimaging data show, etc. So it's the Q reactivity, immediate action tendency to approach which is put on hold for a little bit. But if you don't have a long-term change goal, it's not gonna help you. So that's why just doing training in binge drinking students with the idea to make them quit binge drinking is not viable, I think. Last question. For your talk, um, I wanted to know in your positive results, what was the, it's you, you see some differences according to patient in terms of severity of alcohol use disorder, in terms of uh, intensity of drinking and duration of the disease. If there were some differences in, uh, in the outcomes according to nope. the severity. No, we, so we have lots of data. So we actually looked at all sorts of variables, um, number of previous detoxifications, um, years of alcohol use disorder, how heavy they were, how severe they were, didn't predict outcomes. So it seems to be something which a subgroup of more impulsive, strong Q reactivity alcoholics can use, no matter whether they're very long addicted or uh, less longly addicted. Merci. <laughs>